Dobry večer. Good evening. Dear European Commission Vice Presidents Dombrovskis and Shevchovic, the Eurogroup President Dijsselbloem, Deputy Chairpersons of the National Council of the Slovak Republic, Anna Blašakova and Mr. Figel, Deputy Prime Minister Kazimir, Ministers, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, welcome to Slovakia, welcome to Tatra Summit. I'm really pleased to see you all here. In the country where the Tatra Mountains oversee the life of a nation, a nation so deeply committed to Europe and its basic principles, where the European Union unity and solidarity counts no matter what, where belonging to the core of Europe is our unshakable identity, because we are all aware what it means for us and how much it has changed our lives for better. But also a place where questions arise, posed by ordinary people, living in seemingly never-ending cycle of heavy crises, uncertainty, and fear slowly sets down. This all opens space to unwanted quick fixes and radicalized simple solutions. Certainly, no special case these days on the old continent, but a problem surely faced by most European nations. And now, even coupled with a need to restore trust in the EU project. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a year into the European Union's new political cycle, and the European Union and its members are once again in firefighting mode, this time around literally across the continent, in multiple directions. It even looks like we have somehow adjusted ourselves to such a pattern. And I only hope we have not resigned to our ability to tackle the crisis together, effectively, for our citizens. Our attention is primarily fully preoccupied by migration and refugee problem. Still, the Euro crisis and the Ukrainian crisis are far from over yet. None of this can be resolved at a national level alone. We know it all too well. The magnitude and the nature of challenges simply require a common European response and our common European sense too. These are the most complex tasks the European Union is facing since the end of the Cold War and definitely the most serious emergency events since Slovakia joined the club. Are we able to deliver joint answers? Can we go beyond immediate reaction and address the root causes, because without it, we just postpone a fit for real life response, the one that needs to be taken without delay. Otherwise, consequences of acting much later can cost us dearly, and hope for the best is probably not a good enough strategy. And this is exactly what I miss so much in our discussions and actions on migration. Facing such an unprecedented challenge, we need clear European leadership, the one that could reunite us in our efforts to find a sustainable, rational, and acceptable solution for all of us. Because what I see so far is a mix of individual and uncoordinated measures by member states, sometimes taken in despair, while panic spreads across the continent. And because we still only clumsily move from coping with consequences to addressing the root causes. So, thus far, we all fail together. By our inability to jointly act, we ended up tearing apart our own hard-won system, our rules, values, and principles, taking roots for decades. We ripped them apart in a couple of weeks only. Do we actually realize what have we done by building fences? Because my understanding is that we have just weakened exactly what European Union citizens love by far the most about the European Union. Freedom to travel, freedom to work, freedom to choose. So this trend must be reversed. And it can be only done so through a comprehensive European Union approach and strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, turning clock backwards 
the firefighting mode started with a long period of euro and financial sector stabilization. And new mechanisms are very solid examples of how we managed to deal with it. The European Stability Mechanism, the Banking Union, and sustainable public finances are our fix. However, it is time to move on from reactive mode to action and construction. Slovakia supports an ambitious approach towards the deepening of the EMU. But we go even further than proposed by the Five Presidents' Report. And the reason is simple. The sooner we close the remaining gaps in the EMU architecture, the better for all. We will finally secure stability, prosperity and credibility of the Eurozone. And I do hope for as long as possible. The speed of the EMU deepening is one aspect, but also the quality of agreed measures is crucial. And this comes with democratic legitimacy and the role of the non-EU non -Euro countries. Discussions on the future of the Eurozone are our common responsibility, and the member states willing to join the club later shall not be left behind. To share the ownership, they must be part of our deliberations. The 2016 Slovak EU presidency will be a unique opportunity to shape this process. We will move this key issue forward. It is vital for the Eurozone, the European Union as such, and our citizens. And we will do so in a close cooperation with all relevant partners. Because what started as a crisis of our currency quickly transformed into crisis of responsibility and mutual trust and respect for rules. Those rules and principles we already had in place, exactly to safeguard one of the EU's most iconic symbols, the euro, as part of our cementing the EU identity. And so regaining trust of citizens in the European Union becomes the lacking piece in our puzzle. We have to make it less abstract and more tangible for them. We have to be reachable and accountable on European issues. Easy to understand, with focus on practical results, aimed at improving people's daily lives. Less words, more effective action. This topic has been around for some time, but still there is no room for complacency. Political responsibility and democratic legitimacy are key in strengthening European integration process. And that's about ownership. The current European Commission is more political as it reflects the results of elections to the European Parliament. Of course, we do respect institutional limitations. But if the Commission is still going to be perceived as a triple B, namely Brussels bureaucratic bubble, legitimacy drawback will remain on table. However, there is a significant deficit in our domestic political environment as well. The number of issues we can only resolve at the European level is growing. Still, we are slow in connecting national and European agenda. That gives space for more alienating Brussels versus we rhetoric in all EU member states. Instead of closing the gap, it is get getting wider. Ladies and gentlemen, the issue of radicalism and extremism is part of democratic legitimacy equation. Discussions on improving the union shall not be held within political elites only. There are enough indications that EU citizens are fed up with the European Union and its bureaucracy, and we shall not make it worse by not listening to their complaints. Otherwise, it will create estrangement and the wave of extremism will further continue to climb. We see it in all corners of Europe, in all member countries, and the new ones alike, in South as well as in North. Populism and nationalism on the rise. New parties are in, mainstream is old-fashioned. Easy answers to complex questions. Disappointment, blame game, hate. People are tired and hopeless, and especially young ones are easy victims of radical and extremist calling. Francis Fukuyama's end of history heralded ultimate victory of liberal democracy 
That was 25 years ago. Apparently, the fight is not over yet. Today, we hear doubtful voices in Europe and America about the very core of our values. I do not share these doubts. I do believe in European project based on values of freedom and democracy. But we have to make our case strong again and communicate it clearly. We also have to be very vocal about alternatives. The UK referendum on the EU will be yet another challenge. But as I've mentioned already, I see a positive side of it. It will make us all think again about the strategic heading of our union. This could be an intellectual and practical audit of our functioning and preparedness to face challenges. Given the complexity of crisis, it is the right time to do so. Just to avoid further misunderstandings and potential tensions inside the European Union. Because they divide us. Probably more than ever before. Member states are too focused on narrowly defined national interests and domestic issues. The European Union tends to be often too Eurocentric, inward looking, and somehow missing the bigger picture. You surely heard this before as well. The UK referendum is a reality and an, and an opportunity. We should look at it as the glass half full rather than half empty and generate a maximum positive result for the European Union and its member states, including the United Kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said already, we are close to our historically first EU presidency in the second half of 2016. All the crises and challenges I have mentioned will be reflected by it. We will do our utmost to help find sustainable solutions. We will concentrate on primary issues and adding our own value, like leveling down the amount of legislation created at the EU level and better focus on its quality and implementation, but also bring about practical positive change with the investment program, the energy union, the digital economy, or the TTIP. Our presidency will explore it further and advance their agenda. Just to demonstrate that the European Union is still in, with its great ideas, fit for its talented nations, and to make sure there is no place for extreme alternatives. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest single force of the EU project after 1945, personal memories of war disappeared. Existential threats and the Soviet Union are gone. For the generation born after 1989, knowledge of continents tortured history is shallow. Their experience has been in a Europe of peace, freedom, and prosperity. From this angle, the EU can be even viewed as a victim of its own success. There are European Union's huge achievements, no one doubts, like the single market. It's been revolutionary in changes it has brought. Time-consuming border crossings are mainly gone. New jobs have been created. Business has access to bigger marketplace. Consumers have access to a wider range of products and services at more competitive prices. Competition has encouraged innovation. Technical standards and regulations have been improved and reduced. Costly and protectionist laws replaced with harmonized EU-wide standards and the European environment is cleaner. The European market became an irresistible economic magnet. It even allows the EU to extend its soft influence on a global scale. The concern today is not that the single market has gone too far but that it has not gone far enough. Young generation struggles to find a job. The youth unemployment is extremely high. No wonder they do not see any perspective and trust in the European project. An increasing number of people have turned their backs on Europe in recent years. What's the reason? Dissatisfaction and disillusion with the current state of the Union. Many citizens continue to support basic notion of European integration, but there is a widespread perception that the EU is less and less able to cope with the immediate daily problems. Jean-Claude Juncker has summed, it, summed up our malaise recently, and I will quote him. When I'm on another continent, 
I see eyes shine when those I visit talk about Europe. And when I return to Brussels or Luxembourg, I find myself in a valley of fears, a valle lacrimaru. We do not know who we are, and we are not proud of the solid achievements of our predecessors." End quote. Unfortunately, I think many of us would harbor the same feelings and experience as expressed by the Commission's President. Dear friends and colleagues, European integration idea was born as an economic and political project on the ruins of the World War II. Never more was a driving force behind thinking of its founding fathers. Throughout the years, a central argument for Western European integration was to counter the Soviet threat. And the growing prosperity of Western Europe had a magnetic effect on, on those who saw it. Of course, we, isolated behind the Iron Curtain, craved for, for it. Back to Europe thus became one of the Velvet Revolution's principal credos. It was an expression of wish for freedom and civil liberties. The values we were deprived of for more than 40 years. It was a voice of our will to belong to the West. But it was also a wish to live more prosperous and fulfilling lives and to deliver this unique opportunity to future generations. We shall not let slip it away once and for all. In our case, the vision of, integra of integration was strong enough. In late 90s, it created an unprecedented wave of civic activism to put us back on the integration path. And so the Slovak success story became well known. We made it from latecomers to the very core of European integration. We call our home the European Union, the Eurozone, and the Schengen. No wonder that historically and statistically, Slovakia is a real consensual player. Undoubtedly, the last quarter of century has been Slovakia's most successful era ever. European integration has been the cornerstone and the driving force of our endeavors, and in some way a springboard for our society, reborn in post-Cold War period. We are proud of what we have achieved, thanks to our persistence and determination. They helped us to get over the difficult years of deep structural reforms, and with firm support from our partners abroad. Now we share our story. Our transitive experience is highly appreciated by countries to the east or in the Balkans, because this is exactly what they need. And we know their journey to the European Union will be long and bumpy. A few words about our external environment, because recently this is what matters so much. We need to be honest to ourselves and see the world as it is, not only through Brussels' EU-centric eyes. The common policy vis-a-vis -vis our partners outside the European Union must be worth its name. But this happens to the contrary. What we often see is sort of a beauty contest of various public statements, but they cannot be a substitute of a real solid policy. The collective red lines should be well known and respected. Once agreed, they have to be upheld by all. If we still have an ambition to speak with one voice, with or on Russia, Ukraine, Syria, etc. We also tend to be preoccupied by short-sighted results. Somehow we try to get the problems off the table as soon as possible, or even believe it will somehow automatically by itself evolve into something we wish for. More strategic thinking is definitely needed in Europe and backed by classic hard security considerations, which is largely missing. Because in the end, it is up to us to collectively shape and co-navigate the European Union's common foreign and security policy. Ladies and gentlemen, the European Union is a common project where we all are share, share, shareholders. We are responsible for its success. To paraphrase uh, Sir Winston Churchill's famous quote, I would say European integration project has given so much to so many, and it is recognized by so few for doing it these days. EU bashing became a fashion in many co countries and many corners of our country, continent. On the one hand, the European Union is criticized for being too weak and cumbersome to act. On the other hand, the EU is vilified 
by some to be responsible for almost all kinds of evil around us. Obviously, we have a communication and legitimacy problem. But it does not change the fact that Euro European Union countries belong to the most developed in the world. It is us having best living standards. We live in peace and safety. Cooperation and friendly mode guide our behavior. Our community of shared values remains an inspira inspiration. They are attractive for those who want to join it and a topic of envy for some others. The European Union is our creation. It is globally unique. No other similar regional effort has ever brought so much living comfort to its citizens. This is indisputable. Thus, we have to take a good care of it and protect it and to help it further grow. But we badly need reform and action. We need to be on the court and not sitting on the fence because it is our court. It is a space we want our com common future to emerge from. Let me assure you that Slovakia is ready to play its part in this common endeavor. I thank you very much for your attention and wish you a pleasant evening.